So hello everyone, uh, I'm Yogesh Rawat and I will give you like a brief overview of uh, deep learning today and specifically I think I will talk about mainly recurrent neural networks and some of the training strategies like the training parameters you need to train your network uh, independent of like which project you are working on all those things will be useful. So before, uh, so yeah, so this will be the agenda. So we'll start with recurrent neural networks, start with LSTM, talk about some of the applications, and then some guidelines like how you should train your network, what are the different parameters. We'll talk about loss function. We will talk about like how you can optimize your networks, what are the different optimizers which are available to you. Then during training, what kind of issues you face, like there can be overfitting, there could be some other issues. So briefly cover those. And I think finally I have a slide on this GAN generative adversarial network, probably one or two. I will just give you an overview about what this is. Now, before we begin, uh, what I want is, I want each of you to like briefly introduce yourself. I think we have, you have done that already uh, in your uh, kickoff. But what I want to know is what kind of deep learning experience you already have, in case you have, and if it's not that perfectly fine. And if I'm not sure like if you had any other lecture uh, on deep learning in this RU program yet, so what you should do is briefly introduce yourself and then talk about if you have some experience in deep learning, what kind of experience, what kind of things you already know. And if you have done like some research project before, you can talk about that as well. So why don't we begin with Christian? Hi. Um, Hi. So, um, Wait, so what, what did you want us to talk, talk about before our experience? Yeah, like if you have any experience on deep learning. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't really have any like hands-on experience with it, but I've mm -hmm. taken a couple classes in like computer vision and machine learning. So um, I have a pretty good understanding of the theory behind it. I haven't actually done much of it myself though. Okay, so what kind of things you have done? Like, what kind of networks? Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I've, in my classes, I've learned about um, convolutional neural networks and okay. mm -hmm. like the sort of the, the math and the theory behind deep learning in general. Um, and like, but like, besides like computer vision and deep learning, um, I've also taking classes on just like machine learning in general, like in different uh, types of models. Okay, so you know CNN, that's fine. And when you say theory, like what kind of theory? You mean like optimization and all those things or? Uh, yeah, just like the different algorithms that are involved in finding the um, optimal weights. Oh, okay, so that's good. I think that, I think that will be really helpful. So. All right, so that's good. Let's move on to Pedro. Um, so I don't, I've never taken an actual class, so I would say I have little experience, but um, I've learned through some work like with the AI club and I've seen different types of networks and read some papers on it. Um, so like I'm familiar with back propagation and things like that and also just from this program in the last week or so um, I've learned a lot okay all right so who's the next one Audrey hi I don't have any experience in deep learning so all this is pretty new <laughs> all right that's good uh, Yeah, I don't know how to scroll on this list. All right, so winning like arrow at the bottom, I think. Yeah, but it's like it's shuffling the names. I don't know if I missed. Yeah, that's fine. If I miss anyone, then at last you can 
So the weaning, ah, uh, I don't know if that's a name. Uh, I don't have any experience. Okay, all right. And how about Joe? Yeah, besides what we've been learning in this program so far, I have no experience. Okay, so yeah, one quick question. So what have you already covered in this program? Uh, we did convolutional neural networks. Okay, so you know like how CNN works, uh, how the kernels work, and what's like the intuition behind why it works? Yes. Oh, okay, all right, that's good. So uh, anything else apart from that lecture you had uh, in this program for deep learning? No. Okay, all right. So Spencer, uh, uh, yeah, I'm kind of similar as a lot of other people here. Um, just basically what we've learned in the class so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Matthew? Uh, I've taken a deep learning class and did like two or three TensorFlow projects. Okay, uh, what kind of projects? Can you share the details? Uh, it was mostly just implementing different types of like uh, neural networks. So the major one we did was implementing a smaller version of BGGNet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it means you already know CNN and, and you implemented when you're also trained. So you must be familiar with like these parameters as well. So that's good. So what kind of platform you use? Like which library? Uh, I've only worked with TensorFlow and Keras. Okay, all right, that's okay. Uh, Daniel? Hi, Dr. Yogesh. Um, Hi. I actually have maybe a year to two years of experience roughly in like AI and, and deep learning broadly. Um, I've taken like a lot of the graduate level courses at UCF in deep learning and machine learning. Um, I have done a couple of side projects. Then outside of that, I've also worked in Dr. Shaw's lab with the CRCD for actually one semester uh, about a year ago. I was working in uh, unsupervised uh, depth estimation specifically, just for a semester though. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a lot of experience. Probably this lecture will just be an overview for you. Most of yeah, the things you already know. I don't have actually much experience with like RNNs or LSTM specifically, so I'm looking forward to this. Oh, okay, that's good. All right, thank you. Uh, so, uh, Kelly? Um, I don't really have much experience outside this class either. All right, so did I pronounce your name right? Is it Kelly or? Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, Jenna? Hi, yeah. I don't Hi. really have any experience at all outside of this course uh, or this REU as well. Okay, all right. Uh, Arushi? Hi. Yeah, same for me. I don't have um, much experience in deep learning outside this class, but I come from a data mining background. Okay. All right. So I think we covered everyone. So in case I missed anyone, you can speak now. Oh, I think you may have missed me. Um, I, I guess I have some, like, a general, I took, like, a really brief deep learning overview class at some point. It was, like, a week, but it did get, like, cover, like, each of the like general kind of architectures like LSTMs, like RNNs, whatever, that general kind of thing. And also I took an NLP class so like I had like more experience with specifically RNNs and like those kinds of things. I, I forget a lot of them though. Um, okay, that's good. Like it will be a rehearsal for you? Hmm? It will be a revision for you, right? I guess so. All right, that's good. Okay, so I think uh, that's good. So most of you don't have an experience, so that's good. So I will go slow. And uh, what you can do is, if you have any question in between, just stop me and ask the question. We'll clarify it there. And if you want to wait until like end of the lecture, that's also fine. We will do a question and answer after finishing the lecture as well. Okay, so before we begin, like any questions you have, Okay, so I assume that no. So this is the agenda and let's start a recurrent neural network. So you 
as I said, like you have already done a lecture on CNN. So what CNN does is it it like process some data, right? And then make some predictions for that data. So that prediction can be image classification. Uh, that prediction can be object detection or segmentation or any any problem, right? So the way it works is it looks at the image at once. So all of the image at once. I mean, you do have kernels which will slide across the different locations on the image, but eventually that's like processing in the computer. But if you think conceptually, all of that is happening at once. So what differentiate recurrent neural network from CNNs is in RNN, you are looking at your data one step at a time. And then step that step could be like anything. If you have a time series data, then you will have that uh, step could be a time step, right? And you can also use these RNNs for images. And the way it will work is you will have to first convert your image into a sequential data. And that can be like you can arrange your pixels of the image in a sequence, and then each pixel will be seen at once, right? So that's the major difference between uh, the working of RNNs and CNNs. So, so some example of like sequential data. So text is one like good example. And in NLP, I think recurrent networks are used a lot. So in text, you have one word, in fact, one character at a time. So it depends like how you want to process. So let's say you have a big uh, document or a page of a write-up, right? Then what you can do is you can process each word at a time. You can process each sentence at a time, or you can process each character at a time and then you can move to the next character or the next word. So the processing is sequential. You don't look at the full, the whole data at once, right? And so other modality we have is audio. Again, audio, it's like a 1D signal. At each time step, you have some value, like what's the, uh, so it's just like 1D signal, right? You'll have a value and it will keep changing as we move on a long time. Now, so this is 1D data. The difference between text is, text is like natural language. And to exactly process it, it's not like a 1D signal. You'll have to convert this text to some kind of features. And there are different ways to do that. Word to vector is one. I don't know whether you have heard of that. Some of you might have. So what word to vector does is, given a word, it will give you a feature vector. And that feature vector could be like of n dimension. And then for each word, you will get that embedding. So if you compare that with audio, audio is like 1D signal. Text will be ND signal. But again, both are sequential. So other, uh, another good example is video. And in video, what you have is you have sequence of frames. So at each time step, you have an image RGB frame or a black and if you have black and white video, then a black and white uh, two channel image, right? So this is even more complex because audio was 1D, then text was ND, and that N depends upon like uh, what's the uh, width you want for your embedding. And usually it's very small; it's not that huge. You can be it can be 256, it can be at max 5121024. But in video, you have a frame, and that frame has lots of pixels and it is like if it's RGB it will have three channels. So that's huge amount of data when you compare that with text and audio. But again, it's a sequential data and you can use like these recurrent networks to process videos. Okay, so I think we already compared this, but let's see what I have here. Uh, let me move this away. Okay. Right, so in CNN, what happens is you do have these kernels, right? And you try to process like what's happening at this location of the image. So you'll apply some filter or some kernel and do some processing. You will get some value, right? Again, you will apply the same kernel or maybe different kernel at a different location and get some value. So 
uh, while you are doing that, I mean, computationally, you can't do all of this at once. I mean, this will be some parallel processing. So we'll have different codes doing this. But conceptually, this is like happening at once. There's no dependency between whether you can process this pixel, pixel first or this pixel first. So the order doesn't matter at all. So that's like one property when I'm saying that it's not sequential. And then again, like when you move from this layer to this layer, you will have to look at the full feature maps and then move to the next one. Okay, and so this is like just showing an image classification task. So given an input image, we have to predict like what object is present in this image. So what we do is we look at the image, the full image, get some features, then again, look at all the features at once, get some, get some high level features, and finally make some predictions. So this is like a general working of a CNN. But when you compare this uh, with a recurrent neural network, so here I have given an example of like a video. So video, as you all know, is like a sequence of frames. So this is a sample video, and it has like seven or eight frames. And here we have a recurrent neural network. We will go into detail like there are different versions of uh, different variations of this uh, recurrent neural network. So this is like just vanilla neural network. Just assume that this is a recurrent network. And this is a basic structure. So every recurrent neural network will have this structure. So what happens is, so this is the first frame we are starting here. This is a processing unit inside the recurrent network. So it will process this frame right and then produce do some transformations do something and generate some features or it could be anything make some predictions whatever this processing is so essentially what's happening is this unit is looking at this frame at once and generating some signal right so it's uh, generating two signals one signal which is like moving to the next layer over here and another signal which it's passing to the next time step, this arrow, right? So this is like processing one frame at a time. So how this different, how this is different from uh, CNN? So in CNN, if we have to process this video using a CNN and that will be a 3D CNN, it won't be a 2D CNN. So what will happen is if we have to process, we will look at all the frames at once and then perform 3D convolution. So have you like uh, covered 3D convolution in that lecture? 3D, no, but we have covered 2D convolutions. 2D, okay. So 2D convolution looks at like a spatial region, X and Y of an image. And 3D is just an extension of that. I mean, honestly, there isn't anything spatial. Just assume that it has one more dimension and instead of looking at X and Y, it's also looking at like T, the temporal extent. That's it, that's the only difference. And instead of 2D kernel, it will be a 3D kernel. Okay, so if you have to process this video using a CNN, then what will happen is uh, all of these frames will be processed at once using that 3D kernel. And, but that's not happening here. We are only looking at one frame at each time step. It's processing, producing two signals. And then in the next time step, what's happening is the same unit will look at the second frame or the next frame, also use information what happened in the previous time step. And then again, generate some signal which will be used in the next layer and generate some signal which will be used by the next processing unit for the next time step. All right, so, and this will go on depending on like, uh, how many, how many recurrent units you have. So in this case, we have like as many recurrent units, as many frames we have in the input. So this architecture here is showing uh, autoencoder using recurrent neural network. And so it's just reconstructing what it's looking at, right? So it produces some features and do the reconstruction. So how many of you have like heard of autoencoder? I think I've heard of it once. 
Yeah, I've heard of it. Okay, so two students. Anyone else? Yeah, I have as well. Okay, so anyone who has not heard of autoencoders? I have not. Okay, all right. Yeah, so, neither have I. All right, so that's good. I just wanted to know, like, there's, there's some students who doesn't know. Okay, so autoencoder is whatever input data you have, you will learn some internal representation, all right? And then that internal representation will be like a n dimensional, a stringed version of the input data. And what autoencoders do is like, they will first learn that representation and then use that representation to reconstruct that input. Okay, so that's the autoencoder. And it depends, like it can be any network. It can be an RNN, it can be an CNN, it could be anything. It could be a plain vanilla neural network, just using neurons. So a good example will be autoencoder for images. So let's say we have an image and we want to learn some internal representation of that image, which is in the compressed format. So let's say we are using CNN. So what we will do is, We'll take that image as input. We will have a CNN, let's say VGNet. Most of you have heard of that. So that VGNet will learn an internal representation. And then there will be a decoder, which will be like just uh, inverse of VGNet, which will take that representation and re try to reconstruct the same image. So that process is called autoencoding. And it's used in uh, so unsupervised learning a lot. So because you don't need any supervised signal to train such a network, it's just a data. You try to reconstruct and learn the embedding. So similarly, here we are showing that autoencoder using a recurrent neural network. And what it's doing is it's taking a sequence of frames and then generating the same sequence of frames again. Okay, so what's happening is it will just maybe produce some embedding for the first frame. And then the second unit will decompress that and then generate the frame again. So again, this will do the same thing, but what the difference is when this unit is like passing on the features, then it's also making use of what was there in the previous time step. All right, so any question in like the, in this general architecture of recurrent neural network before we move forward? Um, so what exactly is like helpful about uh, generating the image again? So again, it depends like uh, what problem you are trying to solve. So one basic usage is like, as I said, for unsupervised learning. And let's say you want to extract some features for images, okay? So why you want to extract features? Because they are useful, right? They can be used for different type of problems, they can be used for classification and they can be used for retrieval. A retrieval is like when you have, a, so when you have to search for something, so that's like a retrieval problem, but you don't have to understand that. So just try to understand it using classification, let's say. So for classification, you need some feature vector, right? For an image. And usually what you do is you do supervised training. And, but autoencoders will, so reconstruction, what it will do is you don't need any labels or any annotations to train it. So you just take the input image, learn the representation and try to reconstruct it. So what's happening is when you're trying to reconstruct the same input image from that learned embedding, it's trying to enforce that it has that kind of capacity to do that, right, in the compressed format. Because if you take a big image, let's say it's 100 cross 100 pixels, so it will be like 100,000 pixels, right? But the embedding will not be 100,000 100, dimension. It will be maybe 1,000 dimension. So it means that you are compressing that huge information into a very, a very small number, and then again trying to reconstruct those, all those pixels using that uh, smaller number. So then that embedding is useful. So you get the idea or still not clear? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, all right. So any other question? I have one. Um, could you explain at which part um, the auto encoder is like being used or generated? Is that in after, is it the 
output of the green unit or the pink unit? So yeah, in this case, I mean, this is uh, abstract, right? We don't know what this unit is. It could be a neural network in itself. It could be a CNN in itself. We see, so we don't know the structure. So just assume it's like some function which takes image, produce some embedding, right? So again, so this is like, uh, if this is an image, so this embedding will be, let's say, 256 dimension long. And then this unit will take that embedding, to, which is 256 dimension long, and then reconstruct this input image. So. Oh, I see. So uh, the output of the green unit is the embedding. Embedding, yeah. Okay. Okay, so any other question? All right, so. <clears throat> okay, so let's see like what this recurrent neural network exactly is. So when I say like we have a unit here, so let's say that unit is this function H, okay? And we will go into detail like what this H can be. This H can be anything. It can be a CNN or a VG net in itself. It can be a simple, it can be a simple neural network which, which has just like some sort of neurons. So for now, just assume that it's a function. It's a function which takes some input x, right? And then what it tries to do is it tries to generate, uh, it tries to change its state. So, all right. So this is kind of showing like the full recurrent neural network in its compressed format. Okay, so bear with me. I will like explain it, how it's happening. So this is the full recurrent neural network. You don't need anything else. You only need a function H, which takes input at each time step and then generate something, or we can say like update itself. So it will keep updating itself. And right now it's not showing any output, but it will throw some output at this. So this is like the full recurrent network. And what will happen is first it will take X for the first time step, pass through H, generate something, make some updates, then second time step, again the same function, again generate something, and then again update it. So this will keep on going, it, it will be a loop kind of thing. So essentially like this is the recurrent neural network, it's just a function h, and this uh, functionality that it can update itself as we move on a long time, okay? So let's try to unroll this thing and try to understand what's happening. So, okay, so this is the same function H, right? But we have just unrolled it so that we can use it multiple times. But again, we're using the same function. Now, it takes input like sequentially, look, this is uh, time step T minus one, it will take some input, generate some output and make some updates. So again, the input from the next time step, right? So this is like the unrolled version. So both of these are like the same thing. And it will end like when you don't have anything to input, it will generate something and do some update. So right now it's not showing like it can also throw some output. Okay. So any question on this one? All right, I think it will be clear as we move on because there's nothing much here. It's just like saying that thing that you are sharing the same function over time again. So that's the essentially like the main point. Okay, so what happens is we process sequences and this is the most important thing because why we need to like process sequentially. We can process everything at once like we do in CNNs. So we do sequentially because we need some feedback from the previous time step. So that's the most important part. So whatever, uh, whatever prediction or 
whatever output we generate at this time step, we are making that decision by not only looking at the input at this time step, but also considering what happened in the past. So that's the whole idea behind recurrent neural networks. So, so this feedback is the main thing. So again, this is showing like the same thing. You have the input, you update the same cell again and again, and at each time step you generate the output. So yeah, this is much better actually, it's showing the outputs as well. So again, same the unload version of the same recurrent neural network. So this is fine. Okay, so let's try to understand uh, what different scenarios we can use these recurrent neural networks. Okay, so this is just vanilla neural network, your standard CNN or anything. You just have one input, you do the processing, and you generate the output. So this is called one-to-one -one mapping. You have one input, you generate one output, okay? And this can be like uh, image classification, this can be video classification, text classification, so classification kind of problem. All right, so the second uh, variation is, it's one-to-many mapping. So you will have one input, but you are generating like multiple outputs. And one good example is like image captioning or video description or problems like that. So in image captioning, you have one input, right? It's just one image. So you process that image multiple times, depending upon like how long you want your caption to be. And these are like multiple words which are generated for that caption. So this is like one to many kind of problem. Again, you can use the RNN for that. The other is many to one. So many to one can be used when you have a sequence of data. So it could be video and you just want to make like one prediction. So it could, it could be video classification. You could be like trying to identify what kind of action is happening in the video. So that's action classification. So you will have series of frames. You will process them one time step at a time. And when you have seen like all the frames, you will make a prediction what, what action like happened in that video. So this many to one. So the other example is like sentiment classification maybe and in text. It can be sentiment classification in video as well. Now the other variant is uh, many to many. And it's like mostly used in machine translation. So what it does is you have again multiple inputs and then you're trying to generate a uh, multiple outputs, right? So one good example will be like, when you have to translate like one language, let's say English to any other language, right? It could be Chinese or anything. So what it, sh uh, it is showing is, it could have been like, uh, so it's looking at like each of these time steps, but you can observe that it's not generating anything at the beginning, but it could have done that as well. So the idea here is it's showing that before generating anything or before translating anything, it wants to look at like all the input sequence. And in language, I think it's important because some of the languages like, so English is different, but some, there are some languages where you need to like look at the full context and then make prediction or start writing something. So in that kind of scenario, this is really helpful. Okay, so yeah, so this is like another many-to-many -many variation where you instantly start generating something as soon as you have seen something. And this could be, so the example we saw earlier where we're trying to reconstruct the same uh, sequence of frames, so video reconstruction. So we try to reconstruct this frame as soon as we saw that frame, right? And so yeah, video classification on frame level, that's another example. So what this is uh, trying to explain is, you have a video and you want to know like at each frame, what activity is happening or which objects are present. So then you don't have to look at like all the video for that. You just look at the frame, make the prediction. Okay, so before we move on, any question on these variants?
Okay. Activation. Yeah, so we will need these activation functions to understand. Uh, so I will I will go into detail uh, one of the variant of recurrent neural networks, those are called LSTM. And for that, we need these activation functions. So this seems like out of blue, but uh, bear with me. So I think you might have already covered this. So in the CNN lecture, so have you covered this when you were trying to in that uh, convolutional neural network lecture? Yes, we covered activation functions. Okay, so that's good. So you want me to, if any of the students want me to just revise this, otherwise I can skip this. Okay, all right. That's good, we can skip activation function. And so you have covered all, all three, sigmoid, tenex, relu? Yes. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with this vanilla uh, RNN. So as I said earlier, uh, for a recurrent neural network, we just need a function. That's it. We need a function which takes some input and spits out like some output. And we can just use that function and build a recurrent neural network. So let's see how we can do that. So let's say we have a function A, which takes something X as an input and produce something as output. And in this case, uh, that function A is nothing but a tanh activation function. Okay, and tanh you already know. Whatever input you give, uh, give to tanh, it will just normalize that input between minus one and one. Okay, so it's simple. So that's our function, tanh, and we will use this tanh function to build a recurrent neural network. So first of all, as we discussed earlier, that the same function is used like in each time step. Okay, so the same function a tanh will be used. So what will happen is at time step t, you will give some input, right, and then it's also considering what was generated in the pre previous time step that we get something from here. Okay, so let's uh, try to make this more explicit. So let's say our input is an audio signal. Okay, so audio signal will be just one value. It will just a number. So at each time step, we'll have some number. So what will happen is we will take this number and then the number which was generated like in the previous time step, we'll add these and we will then pass this through 10H. So that's simple, right? And then we'll get some normalized version from 10H and that will be our output. And we'll <clears throat> use that output as like output of the current time step, that's HT. And we'll send the same output to the next time step as well. Okay, and then again, it will happen again. So this is like a basic vanilla RNN which you can use to process your audio signal. So that's simple, right? So any question in this one? Um, I don't know if you're gonna get uh, to this later, but w at what step does training happen? Is this like after or during the processing? Okay, <clears throat> so yeah, I think that's a good question. And training, I mean, I won't talk specifically how you train this, but I will briefly cover it. So let me try to cover it here as well. Okay. So what do you mean by training? So training is something you have some parameters or some weights, some function in your network, right? And in this case, essentially you don't have anything. It's just a tanh function. Right? So you don't have anything to learn. So it's just processing feed forward. But let's say you don't use tanh, you use a function which has some parameters as well. So then you want to learn those parameters. So how it works is you will initialize those parameters randomly. And then while training, what will happen is at the end, you will have some loss function, right? So let's consider that auto encoding problem where you were 
taking uh, in like a sequence of frames and reconstructing the same frames, right? So then when you train that network, you will have a loss function. So the loss function will be the frame you generated at this time step, the difference between that frame and the actual frame in that time step, right? You can use those two to compute some loss. That can be like pixel wise loss. You can use mean squared error, or you can just use like L1 error, difference between pixels, sum those, and you will get some loss value. Then that loss value will be back propagated via this part over here, and then you will update your weight. I see. So does that clarify your doubt? Yeah. Okay. And the way it will work is because we'll have loss at this time step, you'll have loss at this time step. So when you back propagate this way, so you will update these weights, right? But again, that back propagation will go to input, so you don't need that here. But it's also going to go over this way. So then that uh, that gradient which you found that's also going to that will also be used to update weights in the previous time step. And that's the reason why LSTMs are like slow to train. Because in CNN, what will happen is all the weights in the single layer will be up updated at once, right? You don't have to wait for any time step. And that's why they are fast. But in recurrent, you will have to like go through this way as well. And if your sequence is long, it's going to take longer time. So that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, all right. So any other question before we move forward? All right, so this was just vanilla uh, uh, RNN. It was doing nothing, just activation function. And let's move on to like a more complex structure of just called LSTM. This is like long short term memory. This is like another variant of recurrent neural network. And this is the structure of, a, of an LSTM. So don't be scared. It looks complex, but it's not. It's, uh, it's pretty simple. And we'll walk through like each of these steps. So again, uh, in LSTM, we have a function. Let's call that function A, which takes some input. It generates output. And it also generates a hidden state here. And this is like, I think, just the output which is being passed for, uh, passed for the next time step. So it's like generating more output than we saw in vanilla RNN, RNN, okay? And the function, it's not simple. It's not just activation function. There are lots of activation functions here. And I will walk you through this uh, complex function and what's the intuition behind this. So, Again, but the basic idea is similar. You have an input, you take some feedback from the previous time step. So earlier we saw like there was only one feedback, but here you can see like there are two feedbacks coming in, one at the top, one at the bottom. So we use these two along with the input, we do some processing, and then again, we generate the output. And again, so these two uh, values which will be passed to the next time step. Okay, so let's uh, talk about like what the structure is. Okay, so in LSTM we have uh, mainly three components. All right, so one is called forget gate, the other is called input gate, and the third is called output gate. Okay, so and the intuition is forget gate says uh, so what what's actually happening in a recurrent network is you are you are given some input at the current time step. And then you have some information from the past as well. So you try to use both of them to make a prediction at the current time step, right? So sometimes the information you are getting from the past, that might be very important. But sometimes that might not be relevant to make the prediction. So let me give you some examples. So for example, uh, 
let's say you are doing frame wise video action classification okay and you have the current frame so for example uh, let's say you have a video where the activity is person standing all right so if you look at the current time step let's say uh, the person is like in between uh, somewhere he is not like sitting he is not standing he is somewhere in middle then by just looking at that frame can you predict like which activity is happening whether the person is sitting or it is standing you can't right because it could be either way he might be going up he might be going down so in that case if you have some information from the previous time step which will tell you like the position of that person what was the posture like before that time step then you can easily say okay if it was like about that level you can easily say it's sitting down but if it's below you can say it's standing up so that's like one simple example where the information from previous time step might be useful all right so why that's important that's important because there is a functionality and we call that forget gate which tries to predict what information from the past is not relevant anymore and we want to forget that okay so it might be useful it might have been useful for like some of the previous time steps but right right uh, right now we don't care so we just try to forget that and there there are many examples when you can you can visualize like what will happen when you are doing video classification it's not difficult to think of like any scenario where this might be required so forget gate does that it tries to forget information then we have input gate so this is the forget gate i will go through this uh, in detail then we have a input gate so input gate says uh, what information from the current time step should i like consider so for example let's talk about like the same example of frame level video classification and so what will happen is for each frame you will get some embedding and that embedding will represent uh the scene and in the scene there might be some background as well okay but for activity classification do you really care about background you don't right for some of the classes you might but most of the times you don't so for example for activity like sitting or standing you don't care what's there in the background so that's something which you want to ignore so input gate layer tries to do that it only use information which is necessary to make the prediction all right so it's kind of processing the current input okay so let's move on to the output gate layer so this output is actually generating output for the next time step and also output like for the current time step okay and the way it makes the prediction is it will utilize like uh, the current input and it will also utilize like what's there from the uh, past time step and then make a prediction all right so any question on this one we are going to cover all of these uh, gate uh, these layers in detail but before we move on any question on this one all right okay so before we move on and try to understand what those layers are let's try to understand like what different components we have so one component is self state so the self state is like what the it stores what the current state of my recurrent net so it stores stores some information which like keeps passing on from like previous time step to the next so there is some piece of information which is flowing along uh, this temporal uh, dimension and we'll see like why this is useful so let's talk about the forget gate so <clears throat> again forget gate uh, the sigma so the sigma uh, indicates like a sigmoid uh, activation okay and this is the function which does all the forgetting so these wf these are the weights which will be learned during training and this ht minus 1 this is like the information we are getting from the previous time step 
and xt is information we are getting from the current time step so what we do we just i mean there are different variations we can add these values or we can also have a function to integrate combine these two but essentially what we do is I mean I, the simplest thing is we just concatenate these two all right so we'll get some features and then these are our weights which will be learned so this is just a transformation on this feature set so you might also have heard of like uh, vanilla neural networks right where you just have neurons so you move from one layer to another just do transformation using those weight matrices so this is like a weight matrix so we are just performing the transformation by combining these two inputs and these are just biases so essentially this is a neural network and these are the weights which we learn biases and these weights the transformation weights okay so we take these two input do the transformation add the biases and then apply sigmoid so what the sigmoid will do is convert these features between 0 and 1 okay so yeah so before we move on any any doubt here so yeah this is simple now what we do here is this is the current state of your cell like the information you already have right and forget gate will tell you what information you should forget in this cell state and the way it does is it looks at the current uh, input information from the past that's called hidden state here and then decide which of uh, the information in or which information in this one we don't want anymore so that decision is based on this transformation so we'll learn this thing so once we have values between 0 and 1 so we multiply those numbers with this current cell state so let's assume that this is perfect so in perfect case what will happen is you will have either 0 or 1 right so when you multiply this feature vector with this cell state some of the values which will be multiplied by 0 so they will be gone right as soon as you multiply with a zero and some of them will be multiplied by one so we will keep those values so that's why we need this sigmoid activation here but uh, in practical values will not be zero and one they will be somewhere in between but again you will do some uh, scaling of the scaling of the data so if the values are close to one you want to keep those if the values are close to zero you want to forget those so that's how this forget cell works okay so any question on this one okay so let's move on to input gate so again we have similar neural networks here similar kind of transformations so we again combine these two we again have different set of weights we have biases and we pass this to a sigmoid activation function we'll get values between 0 and 1 so this it this input data is coming here so this is again trying to learn which of uh, which of the like values from this input we want to select and which of the values we want to forget right like uh, we want to forget the background not forget we want to ignore the background and we want to keep the foreground so then we will have zeros and ones here where zeros will correspond to background ones will correspond to foreground this 10 edge here this is again trying to do transformation on the input and the previous inf previous information we have again we concatenate we learn this transformation we add biases so this is again a neural network and we have this standard activation between minus one and one so this is kind of kind of your embedding or your feature vector uh, for your data and this is kind of which of these information you want to keep and which of these you want to don't keep so what you do again you do multiplication here right you multiply these two so what will happen is the information like background which you don't want to use those will be zero and the information you want to keep those will be like multiplied by values close to one so we'll keep those features so that will give you some information here which you will add back to your current cell state so when you're adding it means you are keeping that information 
So then what essentially this gate does is it takes the input, also consider the uh, input from the previous one, and decides which of uh, information from this data we should add to like our cell state. And that's being added here. Okay, that's why we call this input gate. So <clears throat> this is like the update to the cell state. So we saw like this FT, what we want to forget. Then we have this these two values. So we multiply this. This operation is uh, shown here. This is like I already explained what we want to forget. <clears throat> then we add. So this is the addition what you want to keep from the current time step. So this is happening over here. And so that's how like we update our cell state using the forget gate and the input gate. So before we move on to output gate, any doubt in this one? Okay, so this is simple. So that's good. Now, once we have updated the cell state, now we want to generate some output using whatever information we have gathered so far. So again, that's simple. What we will do is we will combine the data we have from previous time step, current time step, again, the same thing coming over here. So, so one thing is so when these arrows are merging, it's showing some operation. So right now the operation is addition, it could be anything, it could be concatenation, it could be multiplication. So this is some operation which shows like how you merge your input data. And so whenever you see a split, it's just saying that the same data will be passed to like different, uh, different, passed at, as different inputs. So the same information is like passed as output and also passed as input to the next cell state. So that's just a notation. So again, you take this to the transformation, add biases, again, perform sigmoid. So this will give you values between zero and one. Okay. So the output is the selection you want to make on the current cell state. So we updated the cell state here. So now we know like whatever information we have so far, but again, do we really want to use all of that information to generate the output? So that's the decision which this output here is making. And that decision is based on the current information and the past information. Because we have this, we, we have these uh, weights here which will learn this. And we have, we'll have values between zero and one. So we'll just take the cell state, multiply these values. So some of the information will be filtered out, some of them will be there, we'll keep that. And we'll generate the output. So that's how this output layer works. So that's essentially LSTM. And I think it's pretty simple. And it's like just vanilla LSTM. People have like played a lot with this architecture. There are many different variations because as you might be seeing like this is, this is pretty simple. You are just trying to learn weights to do all this stuff. And you can add like more layers like this. You don't have to limit to like just a forget gate or input gate or output gate. You can have something else as well. You can have a aggregation layer which tries to tries to aggregate like multiple information together. And you can have any other layer. So it's like whatever you want. So this is like a basic structure. And okay, so implementation wise. So any question in this uh was it clear? You have any doubts? Or was it too complex? Any feedback? Sounds good. Okay, so how many of you like understood what I explained? I think I understood it. I understood it most of it. Okay, that's good. Uh, so that's the theory or that's the idea behind it. But when you have to implement, you really don't have to care about all that. But it's good like you should know what's happening. So in code, I think you already had the PyTorch tutorial or you're going to have in the future. We started, had one half of it. Okay, so did you, so did like Maddie talked about this uh, LSTM? No. 
Only yeah. related to CNNs. CNNs. So in CNNs, what you do is you add layers, like you add corn layers, and that's pretty simple. And in in PyTorch, I think you will have to do more than this. But in Keras, it's essentially like this one line. So this is just like you're importing that function. And this is you're adding this to your network. And what this says is you want vanilla LSTM. So this structure, and you're saying 128, like how many, what will be the width of this input? So this will be 128 dimension long. And then it will generate like output of 128 dimension long. So this is essentially doing that. So code wise, it's not difficult, but if you understand, then you know like where to use, how to use it. Okay, so that was LSTM. And so let's talk about some applications. So we have already covered, I think, some of these, but still like, let me try to see if there's something new. So for activity recognition, and so if you have videos, we want to do activity recognition. So we'll have sequence of frames, and so one variant I showed you earlier where you were processing like each frame at, at a time step and using RNN for that, so that, that's one variant. But usually we don't do that. What we do is we first use a CNN architecture such as VGNet to encode this frame. So which means that you're extracting the visual features or appearance information about this frame. And then you're feeding in that feature vector to LSTM. So what will happen is, if you have, uh, let's say 100 frames in that video, you will have 100 of these CNNs, right? One CNN for each frame. So essentially you will not have 100 CNNs, you will have just one CNN, which will be used to process all those frames, right? The weights will be shared. And then in the LSTM, you will have 100 time steps. And in each time step, the feature vector which you have extracted for that uh, frame will be sent as input. And that input will be this XT. Okay, and then LSTM, so this is showing like a many to one mapping. So we'll have multiple inputs, but at the end you will make a prediction what activity is happening. For example, this is showing like applying eye makeup, right? So this is like one way you can use uh, LSTM. So this we call CNN LSTM. And we have like different, we can have different variations here. We can use, instead of 2D CNN, we can use 3D CNN as well, which is more effective. So what that will do is instead of processing one frame at a time and passing it to a CNN, you will use like uh, a bunch of frames, let's say 16 frames and pass it to a 3D CNN and accept the features. And that's important because 3D CNN allows you to extract like spatio-temporal features. It also looks across time. So whatever features you will learn, they will also capture the motion which is happening in the video, which is actually important for activity recognition. Otherwise, if you process these frames independently, then uh, the motion information is kind of lost. And the only way to recover that information is inside this LSTM where you might learn that correlation, which is actually hard to do. So that's one application. The other application is, so let's say image description. So in image description, you will have an image, but you will have like a sequence of words that you want as output. So what you can do is take the image, pass it to a CNN, get the features. And then you remember like this is one to many mapping. So what you will do is you will pass those features which are extracted to the LSTM right? It will do some processing, generate A, and then again in the next time step, you will pass the same features, but it will also use what you generated in the previous time step. So let's say it knows that you generated A, so it will look at the image features and try to generate large. Then again, it will take the features of the image and it knows that you have already generated A and large, so, so on and so forth. So that's like one to many mapping. Okay, so yeah, I covered this, covered this. So any question uh, on these, these two? These two are simple, right? Could you explain how uh, in activity recognition, how the training data would look like 
in order to generate these labels? So training data will be, so for activity classification, we have many data sets, like we have UCF 101. Have you heard of that? No. No, okay. So we have many uh, benchmark data sets, we call them like benchmark data sets. So UCF 101 is one of them. And the way it's organized is we have around 13,000 video clips, okay? And we have 101 activities. So each video will be assigned one activity. And the videos will be of different length. So in UCF 101, I think the range is somewhere between 30 frames to 300 frames. So you can have a video of 150 frames or 200 frames. And the problem is like you take that video and predict like which, uh, which activity is happening. So the way we train uh, a network for activity classification is we first have to do like some pre-processing of the data because if your videos are of varying length, you can't feed them to like your network because they have to be fixed size because you have to decide like what's the sequence length of your LFTM. So that has to be fixed. So then we need some pre-processing. So that's one pre-processing you fix uh, the number of frames you will pass into your network. And one simple way to do that is uh, you just pick uh, any random starting point in that video clip. And let's say you are using 16 frames, you will pick like consecutive 16 frames. So then that's your video clip and you will try to classify that. The other pre-processing, the other pre-processing is, uh, sorry, was there a question? Oh no, I, I, I was just saying, uh, I understand okay, okay. That, All right, so that's one pre-processing. The other is you have to decide like uh, number of frames you want to use. Then you have to decide like, what's the skip rate you want to use because you cannot use like all the frames. So you want to cover like most of the action. So what you do is instead of using the full frame rate, that's usually 25 frame per second or 30 frame per second, you subsample that and maybe use just one frame per second. So that way you'll be able to see like, if you're using 16 frames, you'll be able to see 16 seconds of video. So that's like another important parameter. But we, we, do, we do like, I think we skip five frames for UCF 101, that's kind of like standard. But people have tried other variations as well. Other pre-processing is like, you have to decide what's the resolution of your frames in the video. And you can't have like different resolution for, for different videos, usually that's the case. So you predetermine that and usually what we do is we use a 112 by 112. People do use 224 by 224 as well. But beyond that for videos, it's hard to fit. So it won't fit in your memory. So usually like if you guys are working uh, on any problem where you need to use videos, I think you will use 112 by 112 resolution. And so what pre-processing does is it like try to remove the variations in your data. So it brings like all the instances to the same uh, dimensional space so that you can train your network. Okay, so after that pre-processing, what will happen is you will have a video sample, let's say 16 frames, there will be fixed resolution, right? And then there will be your activity label. So you will pass those frames, you will do the processing, and at the end, you will make the prediction what activity is present. And then you already know from the ground truth what activity was present. So based on that, you will compute some loss between those two. Usually for classification, we use uh, binary cross entropy. So have you covered loss functions in your previous lecture? Yes. You have, okay, so that's good. So then you can compute a loss, right? Using what you predicted and what was there in the ground truth. And then based on what loss you get, you can do the best progression in this network. So that's like the whole process. And you do that iteratively for multiple epochs until the network is trained. So does, did that like clarify your question? Yeah, that definitely clarifies my question. Okay, all right, so that's good. Uh, any other question you have? Could you do the same for the image description one? Okay, so for image description, again, so there will be pre-processing, all the images will have to be same of same resolution, right? And then, so CNN, you will have, let's say, VGNet, you will extract the features, 
and then those features will go to the LSTM. So LSTM, first of all, you'll have to predetermine like how many words you want to detect for the caption. You'll have to cap that. Let's say that's 50 words. So in that case, you will have 50 such time steps. So that's a fixed parameter that can't vary during training. During testing, of course, you can vary that. So let's say that's 50. So what you will do is, again, the captions will be of like varying length. You might not have 50 words in all the captions. So what we will ensure is that the maximum length of a caption is 50, so that everything fits in that. And then a caption finishes like before 50, all the other notes will be dummy. So we'll have something, some notions, some embedding for dummy as well, so that the network knows, yeah, we are done now. We don't have to predict anymore. So the way it will work is you will pass on the image through the CNN, through the LSTM. The first time step will predict A. And then what you will do is you will have something in the ground truth as well. So let's say it predicted correctly A. So based on what it predicted, you will compute a loss. And in this case, I think you can use word embeddings to compute the loss. So something like word to vector, as I explained before, for each word, you can get some embedding. And the network will also predict embedding. So it won't predict words. So then you will match those two embeddings, whether they are close enough or not. And then based on that, you can compute the loss and that's great. So that's like one time step, same for the second and third and fourth, so on and so forth. Okay. So if the words, uh, if the loss function is uh, determined by whether these words make sense, how, how does the loss function relate to the, whether this is accurately describing the input image? How is it optimizing for that? Because what will happen is, so in the forward path, what's happening? you are trying to extract some features from this image, right? So let's say you're extracting features which say this is a building, this is a sky. So these embeddings here will correspond to those features. There's a window, there's a flag or something, right? And so that's, that you'll have to learn to be able to extract those features. And then the LSTM is doing some transformation to transform those embeddings to these words. Now, when you're back propagating, based on how well the LSTM like does that transformation. First of all, there will be some learning here. So that transformation will be improved so that the prediction is close to like what you wanted. And you can also back propagate to the CNN. So what essentially will happen here is you will try to learn like better features which are used to like used by this LSTM to do the transformation for generating the words. So whole of the weights in LSTM and the weights in CN both will be learned. Does that answer your question? Sort of, maybe I'll have to read more. Okay. Because, okay, so let me try to put it this way. So when you see your image and you generate a caption like as a person, we will write something about this image based on what you see, right? You see a sky, so there might be sky in your caption, and you see a building, there might be building in your caption. So to be able to generate those words here, first we have to extract features for those words. So the CNN is doing exactly that. It's trying to extract those features, like extract features relevant to these, uh, the fee, uh, the objects uh, which are uh, which are there in the image, right? Then those are being transformed. So yeah, that's fine. Let's move on. And so, any other question? Okay. So. So this is one more application like video activity recognition. I think we already talked about this. We have a sequence of frames, we use CNN. 
then extract features, pass that to LSTM. And if you just want to make a prediction, we just like average predictions at each time step. So that's activity classification, that should be fine. Yeah, this is another interesting application which says like future frame prediction. So based on what you have seen so far, can you predict the future? So what will happen is at each time step instead of, and this is like the architecture will be similar to what we saw before for reconstruction, the auto encoder. But the only difference is the way you will train it. So instead of training it for reconstructing the same frame, you will train it for reconstructing the future frame. So if you train it that way, then it will learn features for that task. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about uh, network training. So yeah, before we move on, let's pause here like for maybe five minutes and we will start again. That's fine. So it's 11.20, uh, I think we are almost out. So let me see what else we have. Network training. So yeah, let's pause for five minutes. I'll be right back, all right? Okay, thank you.
All right, so let's continue. Uh, I hope everyone is there. And okay, so let's talk about network training. Uh, so one important thing I think it's uh, not talked about a lot, but this is I feel like the most uh, time consuming thing and that's data pre-processing because it takes a lot of time and you don't want to make any errors in your data pre-processing. Okay, just to make sure, uh, everyone there, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, so data pre-processing, it's, it's not that it's difficult, but the issue is it takes time and you don't want to make any errors here because if you do, then your training will not be proper and I mean, it will be very hard for you to debug like what's wrong in your network. And then instead of focusing on like designing a new network or innovating in that direction, you will be stuck in like just doing your data pre-processing and you will never know like what, what went wrong. So I think it's a, it's really important step. And whenever you find like a data set which is already pre-processed and you find a data loader, so please do thank that guy because he or she spent a lot of time in that and he's saving a lot of time, a uh, lot of your time, time as well. So I think in most of the projects which you will do, you will find like this pre-processed data so that you don't have to spend too much time on this. And for those who will start a new project, good luck to you. I think it will be like a couple of weeks for you, but I think it will be fun. So that's fine. So then data loader is one thing again, which takes a lot of time. The data loader is like you, how you pass your data to your network. So the other thing is your network design. So that's like the research part, the idea you want to implement. And once you have your network design, then to be able to train your network, you need loss function. And I think you already know cross entropy and loss functions. You know that. And then the final thing is the hyperparameters. Like, so once this is done, then you tune your network, like how many layers you want, how many neurons you want, which optimization you want to do. So all those hyperparameters you have to set. Okay, so this is like the full process of training your network. And, and this should be like in this order. It should not, not be like you first design your network and then jump to data processing. No, that would be messy. That will be messy. So I think it's, it's good if you follow this order. Now, loss functions, you said like you already covered. So let me try to cover this briefly, just to give you intuitions. It will be a revision for you. So loss function is nothing but it, it's a way to train your network or teach your network. And it tells your network that how well the network is doing. And that's how you like use uh, the loss value to train it. And this is something like a student in a class and uh, if he's doing pretty bad, then the teacher will like spend some more time on him, teach him more so that he performs better next time. So, how well the student performs that the teacher uses that as a loss function to determine like how many, how much effort he or she wants to have spent on him or her, right? So it, it works similar, uh, uh, it works uh, the same way here as well. And the idea is how to determine how well your network is performing. That's a loss function. And when you say uh, performing in terms of prediction or like, it depends on the task you are assigning your network. So then if you have that, if you have that loss function, then you can use that function to train it and use optimizer for it. So one prerequisite for, to be able to perform this optimization is that your loss function should be differentiable, at least like as of now, I don't know what will happen in the future because right now we are just using back, back propagation, right? So for back propagation, your loss function should have to be differentiable. So you can't like 
counts with any loss function. So not all loss functions will work. And so what the optimizer will do is it will try to minimize that loss. So it will try to make it zero, completely zero. And to do that, it will try to adjust the network parameters, so the parameters you have in your network, like the weight, the biases, and all those things. So it will move them around, it will try to change it in such a way, the final loss is zero. So that's called like network training or minimizing a loss. So if you want to, <clears throat> so the notation for this will be, so F is your network function, the network you design, okay? And XI is the input data, and W is the weights or the network, all the network parameters you have in your uh, function F. So it will take those weights, it will take the input, and F, it will make some prediction, right? That's a function, and what you do is, these weights are initialized randomly most of the times. And there are some other initializers as well, but let's say we initialize them randomly. And then what will happen is we'll pass the data, use these weights, make some prediction. And based on what the network predicts, you will compare that with the ground truth. So what was, what the network was supposed to predict. And then you will use these two values, then you will have some loss function, which is of course differentiable, which will give you some loss value. And based on that, that loss value, these network weights will be updated. Okay, so I'll briefly talk about how that's done. So this is like n, just the total number of samples you have. So this is some, all the loss values for all the samples, because you don't want to do that for each sample independently. And there is a reason for that. I won't cover that. It, it will be, I think, too much. So yeah, so this is all there. Now this is the basic loss function we use for classification kind of problem. And I will try to explain the intuition uh, why this cross entropy works for classification. So this is the ground truth, that's the predicted value. So that's how you compute cross entropy. You just take this, multiply with log of this. And this is for <clears throat> the positive prediction. And this is for the negative prediction. So for meanwhile, just forget about this term. Let's just focus on this. So how this loss function works. So log, you all know, based on the input, the value of log will vary from negative infinity to zero, right? So if it's a positive sample, so yi will be one. So again, let's forget about this as well. So we only have this log value. Okay, as a loss function. Now, what uh, if it's a positive sample, positive sample, what does that mean? That means that the network should predict one, okay? And if the network is predicting one, it means it's doing pretty well. We don't have to penalize the network or update any of the weights. So in that case, the loss should be zero, right? If it's zero, then it will not do anything. The On the contrary, the other extreme is, if it predicts zero, if it predicts zero, it means the network is doing pretty bad. Then we need to punish the network and we need to update the network weights because those are not right. And for that, we need a higher loss value. So if it's zero, what will happen to log zero? It will be negative infinity, right? And we have a negative sign here that will turn it to infinity. Actually, it will not be infinity, but it will be a big number because you will never predict like close to zero. So if the network is making like a huge error, like for a positive sample, it's predicting values close to zero, then you see that how log is giving you a high value of loss. So if the loss is high, then it will penalize the network, it will back propagate and try to adjust the weight. So that's how this cross entropy works. And similar, like you can also try to like figure this out, it's similar, it's just negative of this. This is for negative samples and it works the same way. So any question in this one? This is important because this will help you in designing your own loss functions, how the loss function should work, what should be the behavior, okay?
So other loss functions uh, like scale divergence. So instead of classification, if you are predicting maybe some distribution, then scale divergence gives you like similarity between two distributions. And let's say you have two distributions P and Q. I will try to find the similarity. That's fine. And in terms of code, again, it seems difficult, but it's actually nothing. It's just you have to indicate like which loss function you want to use. And it's like just one line of code. Again, the optimizer, which optimizer you want to use. We won't be covering this. And if you have to define your own loss function, so you can define that function, make sure it's differentiable. Just use that name here. That's it. Okay, so I think 11.40, we are already out of time, like close to out of time. So the way the network optimization works is, I mean, we all use gradient descent for training these deep networks. And that's a way like to minimize the cost. I will just give you your intuition uh, how this works. Okay, so let's say this Q is your loss function. Okay, Q is the loss function. And so what will happen is based on your input, the value of the loss will vary depending on what the, what the output of this cost function. So let's take a simple case. And this is the curve showing the plot of the loss function when you change your input data. It's very simple. It won't happen in real life, but I think it's a good example like to understand how the network optimization works. So if your data point was somewhere here, the network gets this much loss, which was higher. And as you move like towards this direction, it's changing. Okay, and it's again increasing. So what will happen is when you are at this location, it means your loss is high. So what you want to do is you want to go to this location, right? So then what you will do is to go to that direction. If, so this is a function, right? Loss is a function. And that's why we want loss function to be differentiable. You differentiate that loss function. So that's a derivative, okay? So what will happen if you differentiate at this point? So differentiation gives you slope of the curve, right? So if you differentiate at this point, let's say this point, you will get the slope and you will get a positive gradient at this location. Similarly, if you are at this location, then you will get a negative gradient. So these positions are based on like the hyperparameters you have in your network or the weights you have in your network and you want to change those. If you change those two weights, you can move around this curve. So I will try to explain like how this gradient is going to help you. So let's say you are at this location, you find the gradient, then you want to move to the left. And left means you want to decrease the value of your weight. So this is the weight, this is the current value. So what you will do, you will subtract some value from that weight so that you can move to this direction. Alpha is a learning rate. It says like how much by how much amount you should change your weight. So if it's very high, then it will move very fast. Like it will jump from this point to this point. But if it's very small, it will move very slowly. So that's why learning rate is a parameter in optimization. And then you find the gradient. So the gradient here will be positive. So this term is positive. You will multiply with the learning rate and that term will be subtracted from this weight. So you are going to move from this point to this point. Again, if you are at this location, the gradient will be negative. So this will be negative, 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 positive. So you are adding values. It means you are moving to the right direction, like towards right because you're adding something to the weight. And if you add, keep on adding, keep on adding, essentially you will come to this point where the gradient will be zero. And if the gradient is zero, then you're not updating anything. It means you have found your optimal, like the value you wanted to find. So that's how this uh, gradient descent works. Again, this is very simple form. It doesn't happen this way. The curves, even the curves are not complex, uh, like not convex. So, and you don't have like optimal, uh, this optimal value, uh, minima like this. 
So again, and also the loss function will not be like one dimension, it will be multiple dimensions. But this gives you an intuition. So any question in this one? All right, so, so this update is done like for all the weights and you will have multiple layers. So you'll have to move like from the final layer to the initial layer. So that's called backward path moving backward. And it's simple like chain rule. So I will not cover this. It's simple like how your gradients will flow backward. And if we just follow this chain rule and based on like whether this addition, subtraction, multiplication, you can find the gradients which should be sent backward. Okay. So yeah, if you have addition, then it will just distribute because if we differentiate, like it goes to both, right? And max gate, it's a router. Multiplication is the switcher because if you differentiate, then the main term will be reduced to one. Now, so there are different variations like of optimizers, SGD is one, and probably you might have covered this in your previous lectures as well. So let me skip this. So this is another thing like when you train your network, when to know like uh, the network is fully trained. And ideally what you should do is you should have three splits of your data. You should have training split, validation split, and test split. So you use these samples for training and you monitor the loss value. So the blue one is the loss. And so if you train because you're trying to minimize the loss, it will eventually go down. And there will be a point where you will see that the loss for the training is going down, but for the validation test, it's actually going up. So this point is like the point where you should pick your network from, because what's happening here is beyond this point, you're trying to just overfit your network to your training data. And the, the training, the train network, it will not generalize well for like unseen samples from validation test. So like monitoring loss is one good way. I think you should always do that. So any question on this one? Okay, let's move on. Okay. So your so that was overfitting when your training loss is going down, but your validation and testing loss is not. So this is one scenario. So what's happening is you're trying to overfit your training data. So you're going through all the data points very precisely because your optimization is based on the training samples, right? So eventually this will happen if you train a lot. So then what will happen is during test time, because this is overfitted in the training data, it won't perform well. So another is like underfitting and this will happen if you have a very high learning rate maybe. So it's not fitting that well. What you want is you want just write mean. So this will be well generalized. This is just showing like what overfitting, underfitting, and correct fitting is. So just to explain, what will happen here is for this data point. So let, let's say this red one uh, is from your testing data. The curve is too far away from like this point. This is huge error, right? And in this one, because underfitting again, for this point, it's too far away. But in this one, because it's like just right, it's not that far. Okay, so, so there are different strategies like to avoid this, there are degradation. Again, you don't have to worry about this. Just indicate in your, indicate in your uh, parameters where you want to use regradation. There are different, like L1, L2, and elastic, fine. You can use dropout, you can use batch norm. I won't cover these. Uh, so let's cover dropout. So dropout is, what you do is you switch off some of the neurons like stochastically. You randomly switch off these. So what will happen is when you will train your network on training samples, some of the neurons are not going to learn. So it's kind of limiting 
the capacity of the network and since this is done like randomly sometimes they will train sometimes they will they won't so this kind of make the network generalize and avoid overfitting and usually like you turn off like 50% of the neurons that usually works and that's code it's pretty easy you just have to add a layer again batch norm is another thing let's skip this one okay so the final thing is generative adversarial network let me go this quickly so first of all have any one of you like uh, heard of this before yes yes yeah. okay all of you so that's good it's that popular okay so for those who already know it will be a revision that's fine but for the others i will try to go very basic so what's the idea of generative adversarial network so there are two things first is generative second is adversarial so adversarial means you have an adversary which is guiding you like to do better so it's like uh, your friend from high school who always criticizes you so you all might have a friend like who will whatever you do he will always say it's bad it's bad it's bad and for some of the students it's kind of demotivating because you get frustrated right because you are human but in this case it's a network it will not it will never be frustrated so you it will always be motivated so it's like those students who gets motivated by criticism so those students like if someone says them I mean you are bad you are not good at this then they will try to do better again next day that person the professor will say you are doing bad then he will get more even more motivated he will do even better and he will get he will improve like right? he will improve over time so this network is like that person he doesn't have feelings anything he just gets motivated when someone is trying to criticize him so the adversary is like that criticizer which will tell the network that you are doing bad and the generative part is that person who is actually doing something who is being criticized so these are the two main components of this generative adversarial network so let me give you a simple example how this thing works uh so let's say this person the generative person the generative network in this case it's trying to learn how to draw digits okay and the adversary in this case it's the discriminator what it will do is it will criticize whatever this generator is generating all right and that way this generator will improve as we move on and eventually it will learn like how to draw a very good digit so let's begin from the like let's uh, take it from the start what will happen is usually we take a random noise it's a generator which will try to generate something so initially it will draw something which will be not like close to digit right it will be something very rough then we have this discriminator which is like the criticizer we also have to train this because this discriminator should know like whether this is a digit or not so we also train this person and the way we train this is we show this person the real set of digits and we also show like the digits which this generator is generating so we will then use these to train this, this discriminator so this discriminator will know like okay this is fake this is real all right so he has a good understanding he's not a fool he's also an expert so we are also going to train him now what will happen is this generator will generate something it will be sent to the discriminator and based on how good this image is it will say like whether this is real or fake okay so initially it will be pretty bad this computer will be very confident it will say it's a fake so based on how by how much confidence the discriminator is saying it's fake let's say it's uh, trying to predict a rating between 0 and 100 so initially it will get a zero so based on that prediction we will compute a loss function for this generator so if it's zero we will just reverse this we will make that 100 so if the score is zero we will penalize it by 100 and train this so it's kind of acting as a loss function for training this generator all right 
So it will say, okay, 100, that's pretty bad. It will try to adjust the weight, all right? And in the next training, it will try to improve. And then eventually what will happen is it will try to learn. So let's say 50% of the time it's real, 50% of the time it's fake. Then the discriminator will, sometimes it will be confused, sometimes it won't. And so this is like a min-max game, which is coming out of game theory. So when everything is trained well, what will happen is there will be a balance. And the balance will be 50% of the time the discriminator will win. And 50% of the time the generator will win. And eventually the generator will learn like how to draw good images. So this is like just the intuition, but this idea can be used and has been used in a lot of, lot of problems. So we have people have used this for VD generation. Uh, we have used this for tag prediction. We have used this for classification and almost like all the problem domains. And the idea is like, it, this gives us like one additional loss in some of this adversarial. So that's the idea of GAN and yeah, so most, the most popular thing is, I think is image generation. You might have seen like all those works where they can generate like fake images these days. So that's based on this generative adversarial network. So that's it from my side. And I think we can end it here. And if you have any last questions, I will take that. So we are all set. Yes. Sir. Okay. All right. So that was good. And so I think I will see you on Friday when we'll have those presentation from the project. And hopefully I think I will get to work with one of you guys or maybe two of you guys. And then you will see me more often. All right. So then we can end it here. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a good day. Right. Thank you. Thank you. You as well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. This is really. Do we get a five minute break before Maddie's lecture? Tim? I guess so. Is it a different?